Thank you. It's my privilege to introduce Barbara Lowe, our conference chair. Barbara's an avid collector and part-time dealer of trade cards and advertising materials and a member of the board of directors of the Ephemera Society. She's committed to expanding the society's relevance and influence into the community by making more people aware of ephemera and its importance to both our history and everyday lives. For the past six years, Barbara has served dutifully as chair of the ESA conference committee, which plans and organizes, <coughs> excuse me, all aspects of the scholarly annual Listen and Learn event which ephemera dealers, collectors, and researchers alike look forward to each March in Greenwich. Please join me in acknowledging Barbara's very successful leadership in filling the very large shoes of her predecessors, Diane Dubois and Robert Dalton Harris. Thank you, Barbara. Hi. <laughs> well, I'm glad that we're all here and um, if of course I left mine up there <laughs> at my table. I just wanted to welcome you to Ephemera 35. Um, we're very excited about our program this year, The Sporting Life. And I'm mostly going to do housekeeping announcements right now. Um, I think most of you are familiar with the layout of the hotel, but in case you're not, as you exit this door, the restrooms are to the left, and there's also a payphone there, one of those antiquated items. And um, you can uh, take advantage of that uh, as needed or when we have breaks. Um, I'm going to ask everybody to please turn their cell phones off and imagine that we're in a theater, because we are. <laughs> and real quickly, I'm going to run through the program. Um, we start at 9 with... Um, our uh, baseball presentation by Mike Pike. Then at 10 o'clock, we're going to have a break for 15 minutes. Then after that, we have a busy rest of the morning with pedestrianism at 10.15, the crucial role of ephemera in tracing black basketball history at 11, and 11.45, the sport of selling, and uh, I'm sorry, the selling of sport and the sport of selling. Then we're going to have a lunch break from 12.30 to 2. And after that, we'll have our afternoon presenters, which will be at 2 o'clock, Victorian Tabletop Games and the Cult of Manliness, book-based games and game-based books in 19th century America. Then we'll have another break from 3.30 to 3.45. Then at 3.45, we'll start again with Go Play Outside, 50s and 60s conservation ephemera and at 430 baseball beards bands and the babes the house of David and Mary's city of David um, that will complete the presentation portion of the afternoon and then at 530 we have meet the authors where we have a number of authors who will be uh, signing their books and uh, you'll have a chance to talk with them so again um, in terms of housekeeping, we just want to make sure we have the cell phones off and, you know, the restrooms are down the hall. The exhibits are open now. Not all of them are up yet, but they are across the hall. And um, I really encourage you to stop by and take a look at them. They look fabulous. And uh, welcome to Ephemera 35. It's also my privilege to introduce uh, someone who needs really no introduction, our president, Nancy Rosen. I'm Donnie Zaldin, a member of the board of directors, and my wife, Barbara Rush, and I are colleagues and friends of Nancy Rosen and her husband, Hank, for more years than the four of us would care to admit. Aside from her family, Nancy is most passionate about ephemera, especially Valentine's and other love tokens of which she is a renowned collector and expert to Nancy, these artifacts demonstrate advances in machinery, printing, and paper, which reflect then contemporary I'm sorry, events in technology, transportation, history, politics, fashion, arts, and literature, a veritable 
documentary of people and customs of social history evidenced by the minor transient documents of everyday life. In addition to promoting a general understanding and enjoyment of ephemera, Nancy's goal is to create an enduring body of material forming a basis for scholarly research and writing towards which she has made significant strides as president of both associations, Ephemera and Valentines. Serving as leader, she has organized and managed both her passion, I'm sorry, both societies to link collectors, dealers, institutions, and scholars, and through her passion, talent, and hard work, she has significantly grown them in terms of their reach, impact, and importance. On behalf of all ephemeris and all ephemeris to be, Nancy, we are indebted to you, our ephemera earth mother, and we offer you our sincere thanks and appreciation. That was definitely overkill because the description applies to everyone in this room. Uh, we all have the same goals and the same passion. So, <laughs> so I'm, I'm delighted to uh, and honored to be able to welcome you to Ephemera 35. Uh, this theme, uh, sports and games, uh, is a wonderful way for us to celebrate our 35th anniversary. I can't imagine a better birthday party than one with lots of games and sports. So we have a wonderful program with, with terrific scholars, and uh, you can read about them in this great keepsake that was written by Bruce Shire, and we have an insert by Donnie Zaldin with sports idioms. Um, the program and our mug outside and all of the paraphernalia for our anniversary was designed by Dick Schaaf, so I wanted to thank him. Um, we are, we're just delighted to have the scholars before us who will uh, elaborate on uh, ephemera and sports and games, and I won't take any more of your time, so thank you. All of the speakers are going to be introduced individually by members of our board of directors. And so this first introduction will be done by George Fox. Thank you, Nancy. Well, it was 36 years ago in 1979 when, as I live in San Francisco, a tall, lanky guy showed up for the printer's ways goose that used to, was a happening in San Francisco where all the letterpress printers from all over the country used to gather and uh, have a convivial time. And Mike Pike strode in, introduced himself, and from then on we became fast friends. And during that weekend it was a wild, uh, <coughs> a wild weekend in San Francisco and we had a wonderful time. And since then, Mike and I have been great friends, and I visited him in Pennsylvania, and he's returned visits to, uh, to us in San Francisco. He's a, uh, one of the things that he is, is a wonderful wine connoisseur, so that, uh, <coughs> that f fit right in with our program. And uh, we've, had, we've had great fun, and as a matter of fact, our, even our kids have... Uh, Became, uh, become friendly over the years, even though there's a long distance relationship and I'm in San Francisco and he's in Westchester, Pennsylvania. Um, Mike, uh, basically Mike is a devoted baseball fan, historian, and vintage card collector. He is an emeritus professor of English at Westchester University in Pennsylvania the proprietor of Aurelia Press, a fine printing imprint that issues contemporary poetry, and he co-founded the acclaimed Westchester University Poetry Conference and established the WCU Poetry Center. He's written about vintage baseball cards and created a website devoted to early 20th century Southern minor league cards. Without further ado, I will introduce to you Mike Pike. Thank you. Michael. 
I am tall. Um, thank you very much, George. Um, uh, what George failed to tell you <clears throat> is that as a result of that weekend in 1979 in San Francisco, I lost my hair. <laughs> <clears throat> Before I begin my remarks, I would like to express my thanks to the Ephemera Society of America's Barbara Lowe and Nancy Rosen for their patience in answering my questions. Special thanks are extended to the inimitable and irrepressible George Fox for encouraging me to make this presentation, for their assistance in providing images and invaluable information. Many thanks to Winterthur Museum and Richard McKinstry, uh, Library Director and Andrew W. Mellon, Senior Librarian. Thanks also to John and Carolyn Grossman, uh, and John uh, sends his regards to all of you. Uh, Leon Lucky, James Sexton, Patrick Nestor, and Al Chrisofoli. And finally, a bouquet of thanks to my wife, Diane Pike, who unfortunately can't be here today, for her support, her careful reading, and her patience in listening to me talk endlessly about little pieces of colorfully printed paper. She'll always be my favorite home run hitter. When examining 19th century baseball ephemera, 21st century viewers discover at least two truths. The first is that commerce recognized baseball's emerging popularity and used the game to market its products and services. The other is that baseball ephemera allow us to track the evolution of the game and identify some of its early personalities. My, exa my examination will cover these things. I, I think I left the kitchen sink out but I couldn't get it in. Um, my examination will consider trade cards, scrap, cigar labels, postal covers, currency, scorecards, rewards of merit, cutouts, and sheet music. Baseball captured America's sporting attention after the Civil War. And in 1869, one team generated unprecedented national fame, the undefeated Cincinnati Red Stockings. They were the first professional team and in 1869, they barnstormed across the nation, completing a perfect 54-0 and season. Harry Wright, um, and I apologize for this picture. Uh, I had to lift it from the internet. Um, Harry Wright, a former cricket player from England, and his brother George, a pioneering shortstop, led the team. The following year, the Red Stockings continued their stellar play by winning their first 27 games. Large crowds watched them everywhere they played. On June 14th, 15,000 cranks, that's a 19th century word for fan. I love it, though. Um, <clears throat> on June 14th, 15,000 cranks filled Capitoline Field in New York to watch the Red Stockings play the powerful Brooklyn Atlantics, the victims of a 32 to 10 Red, Sto Red Stockings drubbing the year before. The Atlantics definitely had revenge on their minds. The score was tied 5-5 after nine innings, and Atlantics captain Bob Death to Flying Things Ferguson. I love <laughs> all 19th century baseball players had nicknames. And Bob Ferguson, who was kind of the captain and spiritual leader of the team, he was also a catcher and he would play you know, various, uh, various positions in the field. Um, he was a sure-handed fielder. And he got the nickname. Anything hit to Bob, anything flying through the air, was dead. So, you know, he's Bob death to flying things. For, I'm Mike bald to the sun pike, you know. <laughs> the score was tied after, five, uh, after nine innings. Um, and Ferguson was ready to concede the tie until Harry Wright convinced him to continue playing. The Red Stockings scored two runs in the top of the 11th to make it 7-5. In the Atlantic's half of the 11, with one on and no outs, first baseman Joe Start hit a triple, scoring a run. Ferguson um, then tied the game with a run-scoring single, and the next batter, Zetline, also got a hit, leaving runners at first and second. Here's where it gets interesting. Atlantic center fielder George Hall hit a bouncer to George Wright for what should have been an easy double play but the future Hall of Famer threw wide of first, allowing Ferguson to score the winning run. 
The Red Stockings 81 game unbeaten streak, think about that, 81 games without a loss, ended with an 11 inning 8 to 7 loss. The Red Stockings would lose another five games and finish the season at 67, six and one. Back home in Cincinnati, local support began to wane, ticket revenues <laughs> declined. They're fickle fans in Cincinnati, what can I tell you? And the once mighty Cincinnati club disbanded at the end of the year. They decided, they met in November, decided to go back to being um, an amateur club George Wright said, well, if you're going to do that, I'm going to Boston. I've got a great offer. He left, and, went, and then when he left, it, the game was over. I mean, they, they eventually uh, reformed in, I think it was 1876. Um, but they were gone after, you know, a very short time. Although the Cincinnati Red Stockings had a relatively short life, by 1870, the modern era of professional baseball was in full swing, and commerce quickly jumped on the national pastimes bandwagon. Athletic equipment manufacturer Peck and Snyder issued one of the earliest baseball trade cards featuring the 1869 Red Stockings. The company had earlier issued a card for those mighty 1868 um, Brooklyn Atlantics, you know, the team that uh, eventually uh, beat the Red Stockings. But the popularity of the Red Stockings eclipsed the Atlantic Nine. Peck and Snyder was the, ex the successful manufacturer of rubber-soled tennis shoes and inline skates, um, which had uh, made them a lot of money. But for this card, as you can see um, there on the right, uh, baseball products uh, are highlighted. Albert James Reach, another English emigre, was a successful second baseman for the Philadelphia Athletics. In addition to playing baseball, Reach owned a cigar store on Chestnut Street in Philadelphia. He soon realized there was no place in Philadelphia to purchase baseball bats, balls, and the equipment to play baseball. So, in 1874, he formed A.J. Reach Sporting Goods. In 1881, he began manufacturing high-quality baseballs. Um, this early Reach um, uh, trade card highlights the superiority of, of their baseball. And uh, you'll see a, a little bit later in a, in a postal cover I'm, I'm going to show you. Um, baseballs, uh, I'm going to read my script because I could, I could give you an entire talk just on the baseball. But because there was only one ball used during a game, by the end of the game it was typically misshapen and soft. Home runs were very difficult to hit because of the condition of the ball um, so that most home runs were inside the park home runs. Now that's an important thing to remember because I'm going to refer to that um, when I show you a, a particular um, a cigar label. There were far more triples hit than home runs. Um, this is why it's called the dead ball era. And it's why in um, the 20s, when the ball becomes livelier that, and you can use more than one per game, that Babe Ruth becomes such a prodigious hitter. The overuse of the ball is also the reason why um, uh, many of the early ball players are described as being so powerful that they literally hit the stuffing out of the ball. Well, the stuffing was ready to come out anyway, <laughs> you know. So, I mean, Nap Lajue is described very early in his career when he was playing for the Philadelphia uh, Phillies uh, back when they won games um, as, as hitting the ball so hard he knocked the stuffings out. Well, as the reach card demonstrates, virtually all baseball trade cards were produced by chromolithography. This Forbes Company card was typical of the genre. Classified as H804-6 by Jefferson Burdick in the American Card Catalog, Forbes produced six poses of baseball players accompanied by a word or phrase describing the depicted action, muff, foul, home run, etc. Customers would choose the card they wished to use, have their information printed on the reverse, and then distribute them to the public. Um, one of the things that I really like, uh, because I make books by hand and set type and uh, am attracted to type, I just love the type uh, use on the back side of the card here. The Forbes card uses humorous images to depict the game, another characteristic of 19th century baseball trade cards. Humor has consistently informed American advertising, and it was evident in the 19th century. I mean, if you don't think there's humor in advertising, then I guess you don't watch the Super Bowl commercials, you know. 
Uh, although this two year, they were, they were um, um, kind of delightful, or were very nicely um, non-humorous. In this case, the player um, here has created a muff by not catching the ball, allowing it to hit his head and knock him down. Well, flash forward 115 years to May 26th, 1993, when Texas Rangers outfielder Jose Canseco misplayed a Carlos Martinez fly ball. The ball struck Jose in the head. This is after it struck Jose. And then bounced into the stands for a home run. True fact. Now, baseball people love trivia. So here's a little trivia for you. After the game, what did the Harrisburg Heat soccer club offer Canseco? A contract, exactly. I mean, with a header like that, um, the guy had a great career in soccer. Um, the average American male assumed he would catch this ball and never commit an embarrassing muff like the one depicted, hence the humor. The message is familiar for modern viewers who watch overplayed base paid baseball players um, go down swinging at a ball that's still completely out of, out of the strike zone. I mean, um, I can't tell you the number of times I yelled that uh, Ryan Howard is such a bad hitter, you know. Uh, it's the same thing. Trade cards tell us how the early game was played. Notice that the fielders are not wearing gloves. They hadn't been invented. The card reveals another 19th century baseball fact. Errors were quite common in the game. Players didn't wear gloves, playing fields were extremely rough and uneven, and there was no proper coaching, all of which added up to the muff depicted on the card. This Cossack and Company card has historic significance. All pitches had to be delivered underhand. Now, that restriction was lifted in 1884, um, and uh, you know, pitchers could then use a sidearm delivery. And then in 1887, the overhand delivery was allowed, and that meant that the ball could be thrown harder and faster, um, and that's significant as well. That changes the game. Until 1887, batters would tell the pitcher where to throw the ball. It would either be, they would want it high, they would want it low, they would want it somewhere in the middle. And the pitcher had to comply. Now, again, I could give you another talk about um, pitching in, in the early game because the pitcher's mound as we know it was completely different then. It was a pitcher's box. And the pitcher could roam around in the box trying to take advantage of what the batter had asked him to throw. So the fact that this batter gets hit in the back by a ball, again, is not uncommon. You know, the pitcher's trying to do what he can to take uh, advantage, and sometimes the ball um, is errant. Uh, you know, when you think of those inflated batting averages in the late 19th century, now you have a, um, a better understanding of, of why that was the case. Underhanded pitching, the batter's telling the pitcher where to throw the ball. The back illustrates an early version of what was called the birdcage catcher's mask. Uh, this was one of the first protections offered um, uh, catchers. Um, and uh, I should point out, too, that by 1891, catchers start wearing padded gloves, you know, the big padded gloves. But that's, you know, four years after the overhand delivery is allowed. Um, so there's this slow evolution. And you'll, you'll see some of that a little bit later, too. Buford's Sun lithographers issued a popular set of four baseball trade cards. This card demonstrates a typical scene, disregard for the umpire. I don't know if you can read that. The umpire's lot, not a happy one. Um, indeed, it was not a happy lot to be an umpire. Until 1879, there was only one umpire per game. Um, and then in 1879, two were introduced. Eventually, it got to three, and, and now, you know, uh, we have our full contingent. Um, an umpire could not see all the transgressions that occurred during a game. And because their calls didn't always reflect the actual play. You know, when we think about yelling at an umpire, are you blind? Um, I mean, they, it goes back to this, this um, point in time in, in the development of uh, baseball. 
Umpires were literally attacked by players and fans, and they would have to be escorted from the field sometimes. Um, this was because of the fact that, um, uh, you know, the game was, um, the game was filled with rogues. It was filled with people who tried to do what they could to bend the rules. Um, somewhat, when there was one umpire, a batter might hit a ball that goes into the outfield. The umpire goes forward to watch the play, and, and somebody might have uh, juggled the ball because they're not wearing gloves. And the runner arriving at first sees this and figures, I'll just run across the diamond and go to third, <laughs> and not even go to second. And there he stands, the third umpire comes back, of course, the fans have seen that he didn't touch second. The infielders know he didn't touch second. But there he stands at third, and the umpire says, great, you're at third base. Um, it was not um, a happy lot. Um, the 25-card Duke series uses humorous expressions that were applicable to baseball and to 19th century life. Um, the princely fellow here um, has made a good catch with his betrothed just as the baseball player is about to make a good catch of the ball. The not-so-subtle implication, use Duke products for good results. <laughs> a rounder, that's the rounder, and notice the, uh, the barkeep in the back. Um, a rounder uses an oxymoron to pitch Duke's tobacco. The character in the bar is a rounder, a 19th century term meaning a drunkard or immoral person. The menacing-looking bartender shakes a club at the rounder, at the bad rounder. On the other hand, a rounder in baseball is good because it means a player rounds the bases and scores a home run. You can see the runners crossing home plate. You'll hit a home run by buying Duke products. You won't be necessarily a rounder. Uh, by the way, I should mention, too, that the term rounder is derived from the British game of rounders, which was one of the games that informed uh, American baseball. Robert Capadura Brown founded Capadura Cigars in 1858. A series of five cards promoted the cigars by featuring baseball scenes like Judgment, where it is unclear whether the, whether the runner is safe or out. The message, smoke Capadura cigars and decide for yourself. Tobin trade cards are some of the first to use caricatures of famous ballplayers, including five future Hall, Hall of Famers from among the ten players depicted. This card portrays Adrian Cap Anson, first baseman and captain of the Chicago White Stockings. They would become the Cubs. Um, Anson was one of the 19th century's first superstars. He was a very big man for the area. He was six feet two, um, over 200 pounds. Um, he was also the first to amass 3,000 hits. The expression, oh, come off, was used in 19th century parlance to mean stop acting foolishly, oh, come off of it. Just stop doing that. Anson is using the phrase to taunt the opposing team, suggesting that they could not possibly defeat his juggernaut. Oh, come off. You've got to be kidding me. Really? In a nod to Anson's Marshalltown roots, uh, this card um, is uh, for a retailer in Council Bluffs, Iowa, while this one advertises Cuban cigars. Unfortunately, Anson was a world-class racist and was singularly responsible for keeping Ameri African Americans out of baseball. Tobin also introduced black and white versions of the series and I might point out that both of these cards, the color and the black and white, uh, command very high prices, uh, particularly the black and white, which are, are less commonly seen than the, the color version. Tobin also issued the Baby Talk series as a companion set to the larger Tobin cards. There are four series, each containing nine cards, featuring large-headed large baby versions of the ballplayers. Baby Anson is one of the very few characters depicted as crying and it may be a not-so-subtle dig at his superstar status. While most examples, uh, examples of, this, of this said, um, you know, have um, printing on the back, um, there are uh, examples that are blank. Known as the Red Border Positions series because of the thin red border that surrounds the card, 
Um, these images are similar in style to Tobin and were probably produced by them, although there is no manufacturer's imprint on the cards. Now, a daisy cutter is a 19th century term meaning that a ball is hit so hard and so low to the ground that it would literally lop off the top of daisies, tops of daisies. Um, and um, unfortunately, this, I think he's the right fielder. Um, it was having a little difficulty um, fielding his daisy cutter. The aptly named Bluish Green Series. I, I love these names. <laughs> well, we'll call this one the Bluish Green Series. Is another set of nine trade cards. Each card depicts a, a baseball scene like a curver. A curver is a 19th century term for a pitcher. And notice uh, the way he's, he's clasped his hands. He's about to begin an, at least a sidearm or an overhand uh, delivery of the ball. The five card set known as Merchant's Gargling Oil is quite common. Uh, druggist George W. Merchant created a topical salve for both human and animal consumption. What's interesting about this is that the human salve has a white label, the animal salve has a yellow label, and they were often confused. There are four sets of five cards, each printed by a different lithographer. Um, and this one uh, was produced by Courier Litho, and you can see uh, the difference in color. Uh, I think it's much more attractive. The trade cards produced by HWS and Company, Howard W. Spur and Company, are some of the earliest lithographic drawings of baseball players. The, the cards depict the 15 members of the 1889 Boston Bean Eaters are, and are extremely scarce. They appear with number seven uh, on the backs um, or with the diamond S. Uh, there's actually a third imprint that will appear. Uh, it's C.S. Smith. You'll, you'll see it on the front of the card uh, at the top, but it's a, it's a stamped. Um, and, and you rarely see those. Um, pictured here is MJ Mike King Kelly, one of the most famous catchers in, in early 19th century baseball, and an, an eventual Hall of Famer remarkable for his hitting, his base stealing, and his shenanigans during a game. I won't, I, there's another talk on Mike Kelly. Um, he, was, he was quite a rogue. Uh, Kelly ins actually inspired a pop song called Slide Kelly Slide which sometimes if you've been to the Hall of Fame, they're playing in the background as you're going through the 19th century section. Um, he also popularized autograph signings. He'd do anything for money. Um, this sampling of cards only scratches the surface. There were hundreds of baseball themed trade cards produced in the late 19th century. Um, the Corner Clefts card advertises Boston bankrupt sale and uses the appropriate uh, heavy hit for the bankruptcy announcement. I guess you go bankrupt, bankrupt, that's a heavy hit. There were cards that caricatured African-American players, like this four-card series. Nelson Morris and Company produced one of my favorite comic cards, Leaf Lard. Leaf Lard depicts a baseball game between two teams of pigs with a pail of Leaf Lard as the ball. The parody include, you can't see it, but if, you know, if you look up really closely, these are very nattily dressed pigs sitting in the stands. And it even includes pigs sitting in the trees watching the game for free. Um, there is a, uh, uh, Pat O'Reilly has a copy of this card um, if you're at all interested tomorrow. Um, Leaf lard is the highest grade produced and what better way to advertise it than by associating with America's favorite sport? <laughs> Virtually everyone in this room knows that collecting and making scrapbooks was extremely popular in the 19th century. Um, as baseball became more appealing, numerous examples of baseball scrap were produced, including Raphael Tuck and Sons Artistic Series 177, of ten figural figures in uh, striking game poses. Scrap was available in full or partial sheets, allowing the purchaser to remove each die cut before pasting it into a scrapbook. A.G. Spaulding issued die cut stand-ups for five sports, baseball, football, golf, tennis, and cycling. Um, they were produced by Kerner and Hayes in measure three by five inches, and you can see each one of the uh, stand-ups had a short history 
of that particular game. This history of baseball was written by Henry Chadwick, and Henry Chadwick was one of the early historians um, of baseball, and he, he, he uh, helped popularize the game, uh, which I'll be talking about in a moment. Um, these die cuts were used as advertising pieces on countertops, but uh, examples have shown up in, in scrapbooks as well. The erroneously named Scraps Tobacco Die Cut Series featured portraits of nine players from the St. Louis Browns and nine from the Detroit Wolverines, including four Hall of Famers. Collectors of this popular set have long assumed that a tobacco manufacturer produced the scrap. Not so. Al Crisofoli, proprietor of Love of the Game Auctions, recently offered two examples of conjoined die cuts that included the printer's label, HDS and company. After a lot of research, Al discovered that HDS was H.D. Smith and Company of Cincinnati, confectioners and gum manufacturers who produced the 18-card series as part of their 1888 gum line, not tobacco. Um, like, like most scrap, Smiths were manufactured in Germany and are considered some of the earliest gum card examples. Cigar labels have been discussed extensively in books, articles, and talks. I am fortunate because I live near Winterthur Museum where the fabulous John and Carolyn Grossman ephemera collection is housed, generously overseen by Rich McKinstry and his staff. John's book on cigar labels, Labeling America, Popular Culture, and Cigar Box Labels, and the Winterthur collection provided me with invaluable information about ephemera and its production and helped shape my thoughts on baseball ephemera. I could never uh, I could never, rather, presume to Im improve upon John's work. That being said, I would like to look at some cigar labels as exemplars of 19th century baseball. This early example shows a 19th century game in progress and depicts elements of the game familiar to 21st century fans. You know, the, you've got a right-handed batter, the infield has shifted to the left expecting the hitter to pull the ball. You've got a, a little clubhouse up here with people sitting in front of it. You've got a a little uh, tent over here with people sitting there as well. Everybody is dressed nicely. Uh, it looks like a wonderful, um, wonderful event. Um, you've got nine players. No one's wearing a glove. The uh, pitcher looks to be ready to deliver the ball underhanded. The catcher is standing in a slight crouch. All of this, you know, very familiar to 19th century uh, baseball. Um, the background. Uh, suggests that this was a club game. This was a social event. Um, this was, at this point in time, um, uh, this was kind of a, you know, in the, this was produced in the 1870s. This was more a gentlemanly sport. Safe hit cigar um, is historically interesting for several reasons. The most obvious is now that the game is contested inside a stadium. Folks have paid to come see the game. It's now a professional game. Um, the players still aren't wearing gloves. The pitcher looks as though he's going to deliver underhanded. Um, the catcher's there in a slight crouch. You've got an umpire. Um, but what's interesting about this, I'm sorry, I was at third base, not home. What's interesting are these three blue-shirted people at home, first, and third. These are umpires. Um, the blue shirt eventually evolves into the blue jacket. And if you've ever gone to a lot of baseball games, as I have, um, you'll hear people you know, yelling at the umpire, you blew that one, blue. Um, it has its historical antecedent here. Um, now, now it, notice there are three umpires. They were still harassed. Uh, there's a very famous um, situ uh, uh, game in 1914 that occurred in Philadelphia between uh, the Phillies and the New York Giants in which the uh, fans rioted, quite literally rioted. Um, the umpires had to be um, swept out of the stadium, taken in secrecy to the train station, put on a train. I mean, it was just a horrible, horrible situation. Um, well, back to the 19th century. George S. Harris and Sons, engravers, produced a number of baseball cigar labels that foregrounded their hometown Philadelphia athletics. The Golden Ball label is one of the most striking lithographic creations of the 19th century and has important historic association for baseball. Frank 
Queen founded the New York Clipper ma newspaper in 1853 to report on popular entertainment. A huge baseball fan, Queen employed Harry Chadwick to cover the game, helping to popularize, popularize the sport for mass readership. Prior to the 1868 season, Queen offered a prize, the golden ball, to be given to the national champion of baseball. Queen determined that the unions, um, they were from Morrisania um, in, in the Bronx, uh, the unions were the 1867 national champions, and in order to win the inaugural golden ball, a team had to beat the unions in a, in a series, um, in a best of three series. Although the first winner was never clearly determined, and that's another talk, boy, you talk about the shenanigans, uh, the golden ball became a symbol for excellence in baseball, hence its use to advertise cigars. The two best teams in 1874 were the Boston Red Sockings and the Athletics. And the players on this uh, label are the Philadelphians captain and pitcher, Dick McBride, here on the left, and um, uh, the Athletics second baseman, uh, Batten, on the right. The poses, including the American flag, uh, and all of the equipment and, uh, and the ball, et cetera, and the players, was based on an engraving that appeared in the New York Daily Graphic. In July 1874, the Philadelphia Athletics and the Boston Red Stockings toured England, playing baseball and cricket in an effort to drum up interest in American baseball. Harry Wright organized the tour, but it failed because of small crowds and limited interest. This Harper's Weekly engraving shows one of the games, which Harris promptly copied for use as a cigar label. In baseball terms, it is fair to say that Harris was, was an athletics homer. Do you know what a homer is? A homer is somebody, usually an umpire, who is partial to a particular team. So, you know. I don't know that anybody's ever accused George S. Harris of being a homer before, but you heard it here, folks. Fair ball is a colorful portrayal of the game, especially the uniforms of the players, very accurate, um, the suit and hat of the umpire. Now, despite the verisimilitude of the scene, look at the batter, who's positioned in an awkward cross-leg stance with the ball literally upon him. There's no way he could hit that ball without screwing himself into the ground or falling. But, you know, verisimilitude, I guess, has its limits. Um, this is a salesman sample, by the way, that shows you the number, the uh, stock number, and uh, the cost of ordering this. In shortstop, Harrison's sons once again play the homer role. Um, the A and B down here in the corner, that's athletics versus Boston. Um, the batter is wearing a blue, I'm sorry, yeah, the batter's wearing a blue athletic shirt, and the shortstop is wearing um, a Red Sox shirt. And in the back, this fellow here looks very happy because in all likelihood, um, the batter has hit this ball at this shortstop who can't catch it and possibly a run was scored. Um, I'm, I'm almost certain this cigar label was not a big hit in Boston. <laughs> this is one of my favorites. Home Run is one of a number of similarly titled labels. This one is distinctive for the prominent image of the powerful, muscular runner who reaches home plate just before the fielder catches the ball. Remember I said most homers were inside the park? This is an inside the park home run. Um, the runner is not wearing a typical uniform. Rather, the one he sports accentuates his physique and projects his overt manliness. Gee, who would the audience have been for this label? You know, some little 20, 125 pound um, asthmatic person working in a factory who never sees the light of day. And if I smoke a home run cigar, I'll look like this guy. Sex sells. And sex, of a mildly erotic sort, is expressed in this Metropolitan Match label. The New York Metropolitans, the forerunners of the modern New York Mets, played in the American Association from 1880 to 1884. 
there were no women players on the team. But this suggestive image shows a woman lighting her cigar prior to batting with the implement cradled between her legs. Little did those Randy Victorians know how sex would define future sports advertising. Off the bat depicts a tight-fitting variation of the birdcage mask, which I think is, is kind of interesting. And judgment, again, if you think back to the Capadura, um, uh, we've only got five minutes, surely you jest. Um, <laughs> in any event, um, this is one of my, f I'll jump ahead. This is one of my favorites. Um, actually, this is one of the first cigar labels showing uh, Cap Anson on the left and uh, Tim Keefe, the Hall of Fame pitcher for uh, the Giants on the right. Um, this is Hans Wagner from 1905. Um, it's it's not a 19th century label, but it's one of the most iconic images of, of Wagner. And it's also a very highly collected um, uh, cigar label. <coughs> Postal covers are my favorites. Um, and countless organizations appropriated baseball for their envelopes. Fort, Col Fort Edward Collegiate Institute uh, was a, a college prep school. Uh, J.R. Holcomb, um, they, they formed in 1877 and they manufactured uh, educational goods and, and products. Uh, this is the image that I took that you saw earlier. Um, and this one, uh, which has just come into my possession, I might say, um, from George, um, uh, advertises P. Goldsmith's and Son. And notice down, and this, this label was from 1897. Notice down here, um, they say something, oh yeah, it's guaranteed for one full game of nine innings. So there you have it. If you thought I was kidding, I wasn't. Baseball currency uh, was used as advertising, you know, made to look like currency. Uh, in this case, if you took this, this um, 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 piece of currency to the store, uh, to uh, William Smart Furniture, you'd get a 5% discount. And it pictures A.G. Spaulding here, Cap Anson here, and then on the back, the players of the White Sox. I got to tell you about this guy, Fred Pfeffer. He's one of my favorite players. Um, he was fabulously popular in Chicago. He was part of what, he was the second baseman for what was called the Iron Curtain infield. Um, great defensive team. Um, Chicago at this time uh, had a lot of German immigrants, and Fred spoke both German and English, which endeared him to fans. But he was, it, this was issued in 1889. 25 years later, 25 years, that's all. Um, he was quoted by the Chicago Evening Post, and he had this to say. Honestly, it gives me a shock to see outfielders carry a glove nowadays. I can't see why they do it. It's an awful sight to me. Fred would be shocked if he were alive today. Uh, baseball programs were used to identify players, but mainly they were used to create advertising space. These are incredibly rare and valuable. Uh, these were produced um, by Mort Rogers. Are you familiar with these? The Mort Rogers? These were on, these were on Antiques Roadshow recently. They're very small, not big at all. If anybody has one in the room, um, I, I, I have the title to my car with me. I will <laughs> gladly. Um, they're very rare. Um, but this is what a typical 19th century back, uh, uh, scorecard looked like. You can see, you know, here's, here's the lineup for Chicago. Um, here's Anson. Here's Pfeffer. And here's one of my, there he is, George Gore, the, the center fielder. You know what his nickname was? Piano Legs. George Piano Legs Gore. What great. George had very powerful legs. I guess they look like a piano. Um, but the lineup is kind of incidental to the advertising that surrounds it. Um, and here's the, the backside of it. <coughs> Um, this one uh, is, is pretty interesting. Harry Stevens um, is kind of the, um, the person, he, he was also an English immigrant, and he just fell in love with baseball when he came to the, to the U.S., um, as did many immigrants who tried to, you know, seamlessly blend into American culture, and baseball was huge, so, um, you know, they all wanted to be associated with baseball. Um, he started producing um, scorecards for the local Columbus, Ohio team in 1887, and then eventually he, he made um, 
scorecards like this starting in 1893 uh, for professional teams, in this case in the, uh, the New York Giants. Stevens is also reputed to have invented the baseball hot dog, which I think is pretty cool. Mm -hmm. um, and there's the inside. These generic uh, baseball cards probably, um, uh, probably produced by William Donaldson, and I'd be interested in knowing if that's true. I mean, the only mark down here is WD. One minute, oh boy. Um, these are really interesting. Um, there's, you know, you can see early forms of uh, catcher's gloves. Um, this one advertises a German evangelical church and its picnic where there will be dancing. I'm a lifelong Lutheran. I went to a Lutheran college. I was going to be a Lutheran minister, and I'm shocked to know that <laughs> German evangelical Lutherans danced in the 19th century. Um, rewards of merit, um, I think you're all pretty familiar with those. This, this, this shows, um, this shows um, actually a game of rounders. Um, baseball cutouts. Um, baseball cutouts were inserted into uh, newspapers. And this one was done by the Boston Sunday Globe. And you can see, you, know, they, you could create a diorama and play the game. And you can see, you know, the various players and, and so forth it, in a moment. Give me one more minute. Well, uh, yes. Uh, the Philadelphia Press couldn't stand it, so they issued their own a few weeks later. And look how much more elaborate it is. They've even got the Boston team bench. Up here is a, is a coacher. Um, down here is the ticket office. Over there is somebody selling bread um, and lemonade. And finally, finally, uh, sheet music. Um, singing was a popular form of 19th century musical entertainment, and songs were regularly composed to commemorate significant events. Before John Fogarty's center field, there was baseball sheet music. The undefeated 1869 Red Stockings are immortalized in this instrumental march composed by one C. Kinkle. And you can see the team player. This is a very scarce, very valuable, very difficult to find. Well, the Atlantics in 1870, after beating the Red Stockings, had their song composed by Horace Van Tassel called the Atlantic Polka. You can only imagine what was going on in Brooklyn. <laughs> Unfortunately, by not including images, um, they probably lost out on a way to sell more copies. But here's the 1868 Peck and Snyder card. This, by the way, recently sold at auction for $70,000. This is an appropriate place for me to stop, Diane. <laughs> <laughs> this is an appropriate place for me to end my remarks. My examination of 19th century baseball ephemera began with Peck and Snyder's trade card honoring the undefeated um, 1869 Red Stockings and concludes with a musical tribute to the Atlantic Nine's defeat of that powerful Cincinnati team. I hope my artificial book ending has illuminated not only how baseball was launched into the nation's consciousness, but also reveals the ways in which 19th century commercial advertising produced interesting examples of sporting ephemera. Thank you very much. Now, I can't imagine you would have any questions, but perhaps you do. But um, before that, um, uh, in keeping with, uh, since I found out today that I'm an ephemeris, boy, I like that, um, in keeping with the reason for this group and for us being here today, I have created at my press, and I did this, you know, on my hand press, I've created a little piece of baseball ephemera for each of you um, with um, the theme of baseball in keeping with the theme of our conference. Um, what this does is reproduce a song. This song was written by a member of the 1869 Red Stockings. And the, uh, actually, the, the 1868 Red Stockings. We don't know who did it. But it's a song in 11 verses um, that begins, we are a band of baseball players from Cincinnati City. We come to toss the ball around and sing to you our ditty. If you listen to our song, we are about to sing, we'll tell you all about baseball and make the welkin ring, the welkin, you know, the heavens. And then the chorus is, hurrah, hurrah for the noble game, hurrah. Red Stockings all will toss the ball and shout our loud hurrah. And then. It, it has nine in I've only given you stanzas one and two. I'd still be printing them if I'd done the whole thing. Uh, the, the middle nine stanzas talk about each of the players. 
Um, so, I mean, you can get this online. It, it's, it's pretty available. But it's sung to, and this is kind of interesting for um, uh, Tom. You would know this. This is sung to the song Bonnie Blue Flag which, if you know your um, American history, was the marching song uh, for the Confederacy. Um, the, Union, um, the Union soldiers um, had a version of it as well. But um, you can go to YouTube. I would sing it for you, but my dulcet bass voice has... Um, um, can anyone start us off? <laughs> oh, I should point out, too, that uh, the very last line there, where we'll welcome all to games of ball upon our Union ground. Union Field is where uh, the Red Stockings played. It was, all, it was a cricket club, but eventually became their, their home field. Uh, the, the Red Stockings would sing this song as they traveled. You know, I said to you that singing was a very popular form of 19th century musical entertainment. Uh, they would sing it while they were traveling, but what's really cool about this, they would sing this song to the crowd before they played. Can you imagine that? I mean, this is, the, this is if you know modern baseball, this is where the walk-up song began. Do you know what a walk-up song is? Every ball player for every major league team has a little bit of a song that's played when he walks up to bat. And it's usually, you know, uh, really dark and, and uh, I don't know what they are. I mean. I hear these things and I have to look them up. You know, it doesn't sound like jazz to me. Um, this is kind of the, the, uh, the early version of the walk-up song. Another little baseball trivia. Now, questions, please. Yes? Uh, I saw in your camera that baseball is two words. It is. Don't you love baseball? Mm -hmm. Can I say that's a time-going word in Germany? Um, it's a slow evolution in the early 20th century. I mean, Pittsburgh is spelled with a G and no H until well into the 20th century. So it's a slow evolution. I th you know, that's a really good question because I thought maybe I should make it two words in my remarks, and I, but I thought, no, nah, I'll just keep it one. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Yeah. Your bowling ball looked like a grapefruit. Can you tell us something about the size of the baseball? Well, it was um, actually Frank Queen um, a couple years prior to 1868, offered a silver ball. But it was a ball about the size of a baseball, just a little bit bigger than a baseball. But, um, you know, his, his, uh, the, the clipper was doing well and he was making money, so he thought, you know, let's, let's up the ante here, we'll make it a gold ball. But it, I, I don't know if you've ever seen that cigar label, but it is striking. I mean, uh, it's in the Grossman collection, and when I opened that up, I just <gasps> kind of went like that. It's, it's amazing. Yes? I didn't know the color of the profit of the golf ball. And have you seen the early autographed baseballs? Because it sounds like they fell apart. Yeah, they did. Uh, they wouldn't autograph baseballs primarily. I mean, it, uh, commemorative balls were made for the, uh, the winner of a match. Um, and those were lettered and usually with some kind of gold or silver. Um, and when you see them now, uh, in almost to a, an example, you know, they're fading or the, the lettering has fall, fallen aside. So they would autograph things like, I don't know, pieces of paper, that, that sort of thing, ephemera. Um, but very rarely, I can't think of an example of a baseball. But uh, Kelly made money um, simply by he would, you know, he would charge a certain amount and sign a bunch of things for people. Uh, he didn't do it that often. But he was a rogue. I mean, these guys constantly tried to bend and break the rules. Uh, there's a very famous situation where Kelly is not playing. There's a ball, a fly ball, hit to the third baseman. And Kelly's standing there, and he can tell clearly that the third baseman is not going to catch the ball. So what does Kelly do? He yells at the umpire, I'm taking his place, and he makes the catch. <laughs> you wonder why umpires were reviled. But it's, um, yeah, it is what it is. Yes? Yeah, there's a great book by John Thorne uh, called Baseball in the Garden of Eden, I think it is. And uh, John talks about that at, at some length. But um, town, ball, town ball rounders 
uh, they all kind of merge. Um, it's, it's a very, um, it's kind of a pre-Civil War um, influence, but um, it all comes together during the Civil War. Um, you think this one was long, Diane. I mean, um, in my first go-round, I had to give up all the wonderful stuff I wrote about um, how baseball, you know, really evolved during the, the uh, Civil War. You know, during the downtime during the, um, the Civil War, um, soldiers would play baseball. And it was the democratization of the game that occurred. Because prior to this, it was a gentlemanly game. Um, now you've got um, common folk playing side by side uh, with officers. And they're all playing the game. So that when the war ends, they take the, the, the game back home with them. There's a great book called When Johnny Comes Sliding Home. <laughs> and it covers um, the end of the Civil War to about 1870. I can never pronounce the, um, the author's name, but it's a terrific book. I, I would highly recommend it to you. Any other questions? Well, again, thank you for your time. <laughs> <laughs>